Welcome everyone to mastering your genes and, you know, really creating a good quality strategy with your genetics. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Selena Rothenberger, and I'm pretty well known as a genetic and tech wizard. I am certified in functional medicine with advanced training in functional immunology, autoimmunity, uh, gastrointestinal clinical strategies, and nutrigenomics. I founded the Functional Perspective, uh, which is a functional health collaboration through nutrigenomics. It's kind of my goal. I do a lot of collaboration with other practitioners. Um, I'm all about, you know, let's get as many brains together and really help support um, as many people as we can. And I'm specialized in helping those who suffer with gastrointestinal and autoimmunity learn natural ways to heal their bodies so they can regain their health and vitality. And the reason that I am into this and why I'm so passionate is because my oldest living son, we actually had four miscarriages prior to him, was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And we were told there was, you know, nothing we could do about it. And it was just one of those environmental factors that caused it. But when I tried to ask, okay, tell me what are these environmental factors that caused it? Common sense tells us there's something that's environment that caused something negative. Why can't we use that to our advantage on the flip side? Why isn't there something in the environment that we can make things positive, you know, for healing? And I never in traditional medicine, never got any answers. And so it was, always a struggle, you know, trying to get those answers. And so I delved into functional medicine, um, you know, wanting answers because they're just not there in traditional medicine. And so now I, my whole role is to help others and to teach others, you know, the things that I've learned, because there are things we can do to influence these genes, just like these genes were influenced in a negative way. Like for my son with autoimmunity, where there was no, you know, family history, there is, um, ways that we can influence these genes in a positive way. So let's hold on a second here. And just a quick note here. Also, Julie is with us, Julie Olson. She's a functional nutritionist that I work with and we do a lot of collaboration together. So she's on here as well. It's going to help co-host this with me today. So welcome, Julie. Glad to have you here. I'm um, glad to be here. I apologize. I got the times mixed up. I'm in a different time zone. So <laughs> I'm here to help answer any questions, especially in the chat or the, the question section. So let yeah. Selena do her magic. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Let's see here. There we go. My thing there. So what we're going to discuss today. So we're going to discuss the role of our genetics, this genetic SNPs, you know, and nutrigenomics. And then we're going to delve into methylation, metabolism, our genes, and I'm going to try to keep it a simple where you can understand it, but this is the kind of stuff that I really love to geek out on. So um, for some of you, when the things I'm going to talk about there is going to be like, oh my goodness, this is overwhelming. So I'm going to try to keep it simple and feel free to ask questions on that. And again, there will be a recording so you can watch it again. And then we're going to cover the most important thing or one of the important things that you're probably here for is how to create a personalized strategy. We have this great information. What do we do with it? Because it just seems that there's so many different things out there that we can do. So first off the groundwork genetics 101. And the thing is, there's a lot of genetics out there right now. I mean, there's a, the genetics is a big buzzword. So it's like, what genetic, what we've got nutrigenomics, we have nutrigenetics, we have epigenetics, and there's a host of other things. And there's a lot of overlap, but nutrigenomics is the study of how our diet affects our genes. So kind of that environmental factor that I mentioned, how that's influencing our genes. Nutrigenetics is how our genes respond to the diet. So it's slightly different. It's kind of coming from that other angle. And the epigenetics is a study of the interaction between our diet, our lifestyle, movement, stress, all these other things, you know, in our, in our genes. And so that's kind of what they, I think, are alluding to in traditional medicine. They say, oh, there was, you know, some sort of environmental factor that caused, you know, like my son's type one diabetes. So there's a huge amount of overlap, but it does get a little bit confusing. So I use these terms interchangeably. And I think, you know, it's maybe not so great, but, you know, a lot of times we'll say nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics. Um, we're talking about, you know, how we can influence these metabolic pathways. So it's about the genes that we can do something that we can influence. So it's not that, okay, the color of my hair or, you know, I'm from whatever country or, you know, region of the world that I'm from. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about our metabolic pathways. And so we're going to kind of get into the genetics in our DNA and the SNPs and, you know, what our DNA, you know, it's made of um, these different base pairs. We want to know where are the, some potential problems and maybe some roadblocks that we might happen to have. 
So a single nucleotide polymorphism, so you're going to hear SNP quite a bit, and that stands for the SNP, which is single nucleotide polymorphism, is a DNA sequence variation that occurs when a single nucleotide, either the A, T, C, or G, in our genome is modified. So it's not quite where it needs to be. It's, there's something that's um, different there. And it doesn't necessarily cause disease, but they can help determine our likelihood that we might develop a particular illness because the illnesses and these diseases that we get or we get classified as is a result of imbalances in these pathways. And so it can predispose us to having challenges, which is then manifest in a cluster of symptoms that get labeled as a disease. So the SNPs is what we're talking about, and that's what that stands for. So you're going to hear that term quite a bit. And so the question is, is there, you know, health or disease? Do we have dysfunction? Um, there's our neural proteins. We have those. There's not going to be any variations. And so it's actually called the wild type. But then we have some, we have some of these genetic variations. They may or may not lead to dysfunction, which then can, again, that domino effect that leads to, you know, different types of diseases or health challenges. And there's different ways we can look at some of these SNPs. There's a lot of different SNPs. And these next few illustrations are from um, a practitioner that I work with, Dr. Tara Scott. She just has these wonderful um, ways to describe this. So I, I have to definitely credit her for this. And that is we've got some SNPs that they change the meaning, but they don't really change the function. For instance, if you made an appointment and you thought you were going to go see Dr. Joyce Scott and then walks this man, well, they're both doctors. They both have the same medical degree. They're going to be able to help you. You just weren't quite expecting that. So you just change out that A and O. So, you know, there's not really going to make much of a difference on that. And the same with there's others that aren't really much of a consequence, such as are you coming to or are you two coming? Well, they're both, again, not really a lot of a consequence on that. And then we have those genes, like I talked about before, where we're not really going to be discussing those, where this has to do with your ethnicity and where you're from, um, the color of your hair and those sorts of things. Again, these are not the metabolic genes that we're going to be talking about. The ones we are going to be talking about, where we do have that change of function that can really, really make a difference in how our body is responding and then you know to the environment and how our food responds and all those kinds of things where we have that cut and cat two completely different things by just changing that one letter so how the genes works we're going to get one from each parent so we get our genes uh one copy from each parent and then that kind of goes together so there's three different i don't know why i don't have the third option on here there's three different options we have the wild type which is the normal gene and i always thought the wild type should be like the wild child like the one that's the worst or the problem but it's actually the normal but the two that are the potential problems are the heterozygous and the homozygous. So the heterozygous is where you have one of the abnormal copies, and then the homozygous is where you have two abnormal copies. And so we'll see that a lot of times on your SNP reports, whenever you see either a blank, that means it's the normal or wild type. Uh, when you see a one on your SNPs, then that's a heterozygous, or a two is the homozygous. So for instance, with MTHFR, you basically have three different possibilities. You can have the wild type, which would be the same letters there on the left, the CC for that uh, 677 or the AA for the 1298, or we have the heterozygous there in the middle, which is one of each letter. And then on the right, it's also two letters, but you notice they're two completely different letters. So you have the TT or you have the CC. So that would be the homozygous. And all of these metabolic genes are going to be the same way. You're going to either have, you know, the wild type, the two letters, two different letters, or two completely different letters that are the same on the homozygous. So one of the things we're going to talk a lot about is MTHFR. Many of you have probably heard about MTHFR. Um, it's sort of the poster child of our genetics. It's gotten a lot of press and um, everybody knows about MTHFR, it seems like. And so um, it's not necessarily the most important gene, but it is the most popular one that a lot of people hear about. And it's important because it, it does help to reduce folate um, into its active form. So if you eat folate, you're going to be able to, your body has to process that so it can actually be activated. And the 677 involves a base change from cytosine to thymine. That's that C and T. So those different letters stand for the different proteins. And the 677 is the most common in that folate cycle. And I lost my cursor there. But the key is, is that it's really about context. So all of these genes, again, goes to that environmental things that happen, what is the context, you know, that bidirectional relationship of our diet, our lifestyle, um, exposures of the genes, how they react, and then how we can react because of our genes which leads us to methylation. So methylation is a really important part. There's three main cycles that sort of like intertwine with everything. Methylation is one you're going to hear a lot about, and that's where the 
MTHFR gene is part of. It's kind of the master of our genes. So it plays a huge role in the production and balancing of our neurotransmitters. It plays a big role in the stress and relaxation response. So think of like our cortisol response, how we can detox. Like if we don't, can't methylate, then we're not going to be able to, our detox system also isn't going to be able to work. It plays a ginormous role in our immune response and then our cardiovascular function. And so you probably have heard of things like your homocysteine or HSCRP, but the homocysteine, that's part of that methylation cycle. So when that's off, then so many things, there's this trickle down effect that are just not going to work as well. And then the epigenetic side of it is things like our activity, our food, our sleep habits, stress, toxic exposure, all of those things can Im- influence the burden on that methylation pathway. So if we have all perfectly perfect, fine wild type genes, these things here can still contribute to a negative methylation cycle. So when we do have a SNP, it just lowers our threshold for those kinds of things. And why all those things you hear about in functional medicine, why we talk about them so much is because of how they influence those genes. So we have to remember that it's all about the context. So we can have perfectly fine genes, but if we're in the middle of LA at rush hour, we're, the traffic is going to be standing still. Where if you're in the middle of East Texas, you know, on a two-lane highway, it's going to be like 80, 90 miles an hour. People are going to be flying. They're just nothing there. So it really is about context. And so, you know, faster is necessarily always better. We don't want to go 80 miles an hour down the side of a mountain. We're going to go off the side. So again, it's, we got to really look at the context and not just look at our SNPs and treat any sort of a SNP. And there's a great um, experiment that has um, really, I think, is, uh, illustrates this the best is about the agouti mice. And I should have a link to this. I'm not sure if it's on my website or not, but about this pregnant mother, like the, the mouse that was predisposed to um, obese and the color, this lighter brown color, when they fed her healthy, really good foods, her offspring were predominantly the darker brown and in really, really good health. When she was fed the regular mouse food, they looked like their mom. And so it really really completely illustrates and validates that we can influence these metabolic genes, but it's just amazing how you can even have bad genes, but in the right context, you're not going to necessarily see those genes express. And so the expression is what's so important is when we can modify these and influence those, those, we call that the expression of those genes. So let's go a little deeper. And this is where I really like to get into like, you know, the pathways and those kinds of things. So I will really try not to overwhelm you on this next section. So methylation, again, is just a simple biochemical process. It's that transfer of four atoms, a carbon atom and three hydrogens. We're going to see that as CH3 from one to another. So it's kind of like a light switch where we're turning off and we're transferring things. Um, The methyl groups are chemically inert and adding to them a protein is the process of methylation. It changes how that protein reacts to other substances in the body and how that protein behaves. And so we have sort of like ingredients that are needed to make these pathways work. We're going to make a cake. We've got to have certain ingredients. When we add things for like the baking soda, baking powder, what does it do? It causes that reaction. So we can have, you know, fluffy pancakes or a nice cake that rises. We add yeast to get that, you know, bulk there. And so it's similar to what happens with methylation. We're going to, this is going to help change some of those chemical processes and change how things react. So here's the pathways, and this might be what's overwhelming. There's four like kind of key cycles that we look at a lot when it comes to methylation. You've got your folate cycle, methionine cycle, the neurotransmitter cycle, and that nitric oxide. So all of those are just, there's so much interaction between all of them that you really can't have one without the other. And so there's just so much where they interact with one another. And, you know, to make this more simplified, we have our folate. So are we going to eat that folate? Our body's going to process that, and we're going to make methylfolate. So then the methylfolate folate is going to combine with methyl B12, and that's going to be in that methionine cycle. We also have to have zinc and homocysteine at that junction where those two connect. And then the pro- the byproduct of that is going to be something called SAMe. And that SAMe, you typically see with that all uppercase SAM and a lowercase e. Sometimes that lowercase e is not there on the end. You just have the others the other three letters, but that's going to be needed for any gene that ends in MT, but that's going to go around and it's going to make homocysteine. And that homocysteine is at that junction for detox. And so that those first two are going to keep going around and make that SAMe and it has to keep getting recycled. But then also that homocysteine drops down to make glutathione. So if we can't methylate, well, then our detox system is also going to get clogged up. So we have to make sure that all of these things are working together. 
and that glutathione is also going to get recycled around. But what it's going to need to get recycled is something that's over in our neurotransmitter pathway. And this is where you see a lot of times neuro symptoms with other health symptoms, because we need that dopamine, serotonin, melatonin pathways to work. But more importantly, we need that whole pathway, the tryptophan pathway specifically, that usually we think of like the serotonin, melatonin, but most of it goes over to the NAD side of things. And that's whole NAD family of enzymes, NADP, NADH, NADPH, those things are needed to guess what? to process methionine, the, the folate, the B12 uh, for re, uh, glutathione to recycle. So if you don't have that whole family, that NAD family, you can't methylate, you can't detox. So there's like this catch 22 scenario and the why it's important that we look at that bigger picture instead of just let's throw some methylfolate on it. Cause you throw a bunch of methylfolate. Well, guess what? You got to have the NAD family to recycle that methylfolate. If you can't do that, that can cause more problems. And then you also have to have that CME, which is needed in over 200 processes, especially for PMT and start thinking when you hear PMT, think about your gallbladder. Um, you need choline, phosphatidylcholine, the integrity of your cells, energy, all those kinds of things. And so that goes back to, you have to have that CME for that dopamine pathway to work. So it's this double, you know, two-way um, communication and why it's really important to look at that bigger picture. So CME is necessary, like I said, for any of those genes where you see the ends in MT. So for those of you who have looked at your estrogen and hormones, think of that COMT or your dopamine is that COMT uh, gene. You need to have, that's a methyl, that MT stands for methyl transferase. That methyl transferase is that CME comes in there and that's part of that byproduct of, to trigger that gene to work. And so um, PMT, you're going to need that for choline, for gallbladder health. HNMT, that's going to be for histamine. So in order to clear out histamine, guess what? You have to have CME. And then that COMT, like I said, for the dopamine and estrogen. So it's super important for our methylation and whether it's our hormones, our neurotransmitters, um, digestive function, all of those things, we need methylation to work. And this is just a little closer look on that folate cycle and where that NADP all falls in. And this is from strategy. Ben Lynch is probably one of my favorite um, practitioners that, you know, gets into genomics and his charts, I think are amazing. Like this is the kind of thing that I totally love. Um, I know some for others, it's like, ah, but you just have to follow the arrows. So like this, the ovals are the genes. There's a little green, um, you know, words, letters, and then an arrow. Those are the cofactors. And he doesn't have necessarily all the cofactors, but your key cofactors, but you see this NADPH, NADP, that's all needed to process this folate. Um, and so if we don't have that neurotransmitter side, our folate cycle is not going to work as either, even if we have a perfectly fine MTHFR gene. But what I want you to really notice here, remember how I talked about that CME. So like some think, okay, I can't make enough CME. Why don't I just go buy a CME and take that supplement? Well, things can work positively and they can work negatively. Too much CME will shut down and slow down your methylation um, your MTHFR gene. So now you're not converting to that methylfolate because the body's like, oh, wait a second, we have enough. We don't need any more. So there's a kind of a safety check and signaling that happens that says, okay, stop making more. We have enough SAMI here. We don't need any more of this methyl donor. And so we don't want to just run out and take that SAMI because now if you know we're short, we could actually end up causing more problems and slowing down the specific gene that we're actually really trying to help with methylation. So okay. this is also the reason we see side effects on pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals. So pharmaceuticals are based on these genes. It's our biochemistry. And they're very, very good at blocking pathways, ramping pathways up, you know, modulating pathways. And so that's why when you take something and you stop a pathway, there's or add something to a pathway, there's going to be some sort of a side effect because there's just too many bi-directional relationships with these pathways. So just really important to note that, you know, going out and taking a bunch of SAME could have that backfire effect. And also, I just want to add that if you're taking any antidepressants or other pharmaceuticals that can have a really bad interaction. And, and I know that Selena's pet peeve is when people just go out and buy a bunch of supplements because they heard it in somewhere and, and it, you, you can really mess things up, even though supplements are not pharmaceuticals, like she just explained, they can interact and get things out of balance in the body the same way. So it's really important to look at the whole person and everything. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs>
<laughs> it is like we can we're, we can modulate them like just like we do with pharmaceuticals and we have to look at that bigger picture and understand okay the interactions between all of those things so like the key takeaway is what julie just said 100 agree is that we have to look at that bigger picture on that and so what lets us know that okay there's some symptoms going on with methylation we have symptoms like anxiety insomnia immune challenges weight challenges the list literally goes on and on and on like nearly almost every health symptom can somehow how be connected to your methylation cycle because you have to be able to methylate you have to be able to detox you need that entire neurotransmitter pathways and that's why you have a lot of different um challenges where there's all these overlapping symptoms and this is why because of how those pathways interact and so when you have those kind of symptoms it's really important to look at okay what's this base metabolic function that's happening and how can we get deeper into, okay, that metabolism, where does that start with? Well, it goes to our gut, which leads to the next section of histamine and methylation. And I know that a lot of you have talked about or heard about histamine and methylation because we hear this all the time about having a histamine response or potentially mast cell activation or these symptoms that nobody can quite trigger, this gut health or these foods bother me, I can't eat this, all these different things. And so looking at histamine and methylation is just a really good component and a core component on building that foundation of using your genetics. And why that's important is because if we have a histamine imbalance, Again, it's going to lead to other things because that histamine, we need that methylation, like that HNMT specifically, and even the DAO enzyme. There's two different types. I think that's my next slide. Probably yep, it is my next slide. Um, there's different areas, like um, different histamine receptors, and then histamine affects basically every different part of our body. So there's going to be different types of transporters, different areas in our body where these things are happening, but it's literally throughout our body. And so it's important to have histamine in balance. Histamine is not necessarily bad in and of itself. Self, but too much of a good thing can be very, very much a problem. And so when it comes to our gut, especially that's, we see those different types of leaky gut. When we have excess histamine, it's going to create more potential damage and inflammation there. So now we are more susceptible to that paracellular that between the cell leaky gut, or even the transcellular between the cell leaky gut. So whenever we have a histamine imbalance, that's why, again, we see that one connected to so many different kinds of things. And like I said, there's a couple different pathways here with that histamine. We have the HRH one through four, and then we have that HNMT, and that's going to be connected with that MAOA and MAOAB, and that HNMT is what's inside the cells. And then we have, um, and that's connected like to your neurotransmitters as well, so things like serotonin and your dopamine pathway. And then that DAO, that diamine oxidase is outside. And really that's more the ABP1. Um, it kind of got popularized with that MTHFR, and we hear a lot about DAO and taking DAO supplements. Um, there's actually another completely different DAO gene, um, but the ABP1, I should put that in here, slash DAO, that's going to be in like your gut and outside the cells. And so that's what we do a lot of times that DAO supplement whenever there is a true gut issue, because we're going to help our body can't degrade that histamine there in the gut, which leads to that excess inflammation. And then the symptoms, you probably have seen this. I know this one, it usually travels around a lot in the functional medicine world, um, but we have this histamine. Again, it's these different receptors, these different pathways and all the symptoms that we can have with it. I mean, from, you know, headache, nausea, um, you know, any kind of like neuro symptoms, skin issues, flushing, um, hormone issues, hair loss. <laughs> hair loss. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Hair loss. <laughs> yeah. Hair loss, mast cells. I and mean, there's so many, basically everything. Um, it's very much connected with that methylation. And part of it is not only just the histamine and where they're at in that pathway, but because when histamine is a problem, there's a methylation component almost always with it. You're either it's the HNMT or that DAO, both of those are going to need that SAMe for things to work. And so if you don't have methylation, histamine goes hand in hand with that. And so again, just another way to look at some of the symptoms. I mean, it's just all over the place, like basically the entire list. You can just go on and on and on. Um, you know, and the, like another way to look at it, you know, the different neurological, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, dermatological, rheumatological, the joint pains. I sh I'm not sure why I only have one there. And then rheumatological, there's that one should be filled as well. Um, but it just throughout our body, there could be histamine imbalances with both the HNMT and the DAO enzyme or the ABP1. 
And so those are some genes that I really strongly encourage looking at to see, are there potential problems there? Because then you know how to target and say, okay, what is it I need to be looking at? What are some things I need to be exploring? Are you not getting enough SAMe? Is your body not making, not saying getting enough by supplement, but is your body not making enough SAMe? Are there nutrient deficiencies? Is there poor methylation? Maybe there's some other parts in the methylation cycle where there, you know, is your um, homocysteine back, really backed up or is it drained? Too little homocysteine also can be very, very problematic. Um, looking at a burden immune response, like you, do you have um, some sort of ongoing immune response, things like mold, um, heavy metals, those will slow down your B12 cycle and overall your methylation cycle. Um, an imbalanced microbiome. And this one really is that bi-directional where you're in that catch-22 scenario because your microbiome is off because there's so much inflammation. Well, you have inflammation because your microbiome then gets off. And so it's just this you know, crazy again, you know, poor GR environment leads to that endless kind of cycles. But those are the things to really start looking for when you have those SNPs to see, are they expressing? So it kind of helps to narrow down some of these like endless rabbit trails that we can go on whenever, you know, we're looking at trying to rebalance our health. So what is it we can actually do? Because that's kind of the whole point is, okay, we have this information, but what are those action steps? And this is where I really cannot stress enough that it's the basics, basics, basics. So I know many of you may feel like this is kind of how you feel, like your health just completely has fallen apart. It's completely just a disaster, like a tornado came through and everything's a mess. I'm pretty sure if this happened to any of your guys' homes, you would not run out and go buy furniture first. That's not the first thing you're going to do. What's the first thing you're going to do is you're going to clean it up first, and then you're going to start building that foundation. The crew's going to come in. They're going to lay a new foundation. They're going to put up the, the boards for the walls, like the framing, and then they're going to start putting the walls and the roof on. But you don't go out and get all the final accessories first. And on top of that, they're not going to do it while it's still storming outside. So when we start doing those things, you know, the simple process that we know outside of our health, this is how we would do it. Our health is the exact same way. It's just about the basics. So from that, I'm guessing you all can probably guess the top thing we have to be looking at is transforming stress. We cannot be trying to rebuild our home. If there is still a tornado going on or hurricane going on, we have to like transform that so that we can come out on the other side. So storms are not necessarily a bad thing in and of themselves. We need rain. For instance, right now in East Texas, it hasn't rained here. I'm not sure how long. I mean, it is crazy dry. The grass in most places is like brown. Um, my kids and their bonsai trees, they have to water them like twice a day. And where we're at in our particular house, in our lot, we're shaded like, I don't know, at least a third, if not half the day. I mean, we've got a lot of shakes. There's a ton of tall pine trees on both our east and west side of our house. And so even then they're still having to water a lot. So we need, we need storms, but we need to make sure that when we have storms that are really damaging, we have a good way to transform and get back to that house that's rebuilt. Um, the next step is identifying pathogens and anything that can trigger. So whether it's food sensitivities, things like H. pylori, blastocytis, C. diff, you know, bugs going on in the gut, um, those kinds of things are going to play a huge role when it comes specifically to that HMT and DAO genes or the ABP1. And then with histamines, specifically avoiding leftovers. So if it's one of the things you can sort of tell as a, I guess I can call it like an indirect testing is if you notice that, oh, I make this meal, it's great. If I have it the next day, I feel awful. The first thing that you should think about is that histamine response and probably your body just that you have HMT or DAO SNPs or you're just bodies, there's a lot of inflammation. So histamine is usually um, a problem whenever you notice that, oh, I can't do leftovers. Um, so avoiding leftovers could really lower the burden on that gene. So you don't have quite as much of a demand on your DAO or your HMT genes. And then things that we could consider supplementing, I would not say run out, do not run out and get any of these things just because we're talking about this. These are things that should be on your list that, oh, are these right for me? The DAO, that's one of the things. And again, that's going to be for outside the cells. If it's an HMT where it's inside the cells, that DAO is not going to help you. Um, probiotics, um, Florasaurus saccharomyces biardi um, is one of my favorites for the saccharomyces. Um, bifidobacterium blends, those are going to be at the top two. They're going to help rebalance um, the GI tract, um, help with you know getting some of the bad gut bugs in place. Molybdenum, if sulfur is an issue, HCL, digestive enzymes, those are going to be some other things that can be really, really helpful for you know getting just the core part of digestion happening, which lowers that inflammation. A B complex, especially B6. So you need, and then I 
didn't point that out on my chart, that methylation chart, but where we need that NAD that I talked about in the CME, we also need all the other B vitamins for that methylation cycle to work. The cofactors, we're going to need the different B vitamins at different stages. So usually I don't do just like a folate or just a B6. I'm always going to do like a B complex, like a low dosing of B complex, and then add N where somebody is deficient. So for like B6, if you know we're needing B6, then we would do a B complex and then add in extra B6 on top of what's in that B complex and or B1 or or whatever it happens to be. A magnesium is also another one that's super important. And that's right there before the body makes CME. Um, part of making CME, you need magnesium. Um, you need magnesium throughout that dopamine pathway. That's why you hear about magnesium so often in any of the functional health circles. And, and most people even heard about it before they got into functional medicine. Traditional doctors always say, oh, just take some magnesium. And so magnesium is really, really important. And then super important is to support your PEMT gene. Um, so this one, I'm not sure my next slide is, I do have that on the next slide. So the PMT gene, um, why that one's really, really important is because, and I wish I would have this chart up, but I didn't. Um, so in our methylation, we have a kind of a plan A and a plan B. So plan A is the one I talked about. Your body is going to take folate. It's going to take the B12, zinc, homocysteine, make that SAMe. But let's say that's not working. You've got a bunch of heavy metals. You've got maybe some immune stuff going on. So your body is that B12 part is blocked. So you've got that part blocked. Your body has a secondary route. So it has a plan B. The PEMT gene is part of that plan B. And so the other thing is, is estrogen will um, promote and um, influence that PMT gene. So it's going to kind of activate and push that PMT side of things. So really supporting that is usually very important. And what happens a lot of times we see that comes to right before menopause and through menopause, whenever long we have estrogen, that's kind of stimulating that PMT gene. Now we can see, okay, plan A wasn't working. Well, now plan B is not working. What's your body going to do? Now we have this whole boatload of symptoms like, oh, just a tribute to you're getting older. It's just part of menopause. Live with it. No, there's things we can do about that. And so that's why supporting that PMT gene so you have both plan A and plan B is just super important when you're dealing with histamine because your body then has adequate ways of dealing when you do have those gut bugs and you have problems that are slowing down the plan A side of methylation, you've got a secondary route to help to help support that. So things like visceral manipul manipulation of the liver, um, really supporting your gallbladder, your diaphragm, all those kinds of things are going to be really helpful. Um, balancing your hormones. And so that's another kind of whole entire topic on its own. Um, phosphatidylcholine, non-GMO and soy-free. So I like um, sunflower lecithin is what I typically use. And then creatine to help conserve that CME. So that's going to help to where, you know, we're not necessarily taking more CME, but that's going to help our body not use up quite as much when we have that creatine. So that's another way to kind of avoid over um, supplementing that CME. So now we're turning off that MTHFR gene. And then some of your natural sort of antihistamines are things like quercetin, bromelain, stinging nettle, astragalus. And they're going to act on different parts. And remember we have the H1, 2, 3, and 4 parts of those histamine pathways they're going to act at different places on that. So for some people, the, the question is not what they're going to need. They need something else. They might need stinging nettles. And so understanding there's different pathways here in that histamine pathway, and it's not a one size fix all approach on that. But these are the things that you would start thinking of with a histamine um, challenge with your genes. But it's critical to be looking at, again, the bigger picture and looking overall on the foundational side of the gut health and that for our removing things, um, replacing, re-inoculating, repairing. So we have to be removing things that are causing problems. We don't, like again, start building that building. If the storm is still going on, we don't decide to go start pouring the foundation. It's just going to be a disaster still. So we have to do things in a, the proper order. So we got to remove these the things that are causing the problems. And then looking at bile flow. So we have our gut health and looking at that foundation, that bile flow is part of that PMT gene. And it's super important that we have a healthy amount of that because it's going to affect our toxic excretions, um, how we can digest fats, vitamin absorption, cholesterol metabolism. So that's going to be part of your whole hormone pathway, your thyroid, all that thyroid stuff is also connected with that. And then just the microbial balance in your GI tract. So if your microbiome is off, you're in that catch 22 scenario. Again, we talked about in the beginning. So bile flow plays a huge role in that. And we take a step back from that, which I don't think it wasn't here, um, HCL, making sure our stomach acid, and then 
back from that, that stress, like your body's not going to produce adequate stomach acid. If your body is stressed, run from a lion, if you're in the middle of a storm. And that's why the basics, we really have to make sure that we are transforming stress and getting through that. So we're healthy on the other side of the stress. Um, some of the important things with bile flow, the acetyl CoA is super, that whole pathway, a uh, conjugating factor when you like glycine and taurine. So a lot of times you'll hear taking taurine supplementations or glycine, um, you know, magnesium glycinate, that's going to also give a little bit of glycine, um, phosphatidylcholine for that PMT snip, and then water, we need water. So when we ha don't have water, it's similar to like a stagnant pond that's not healthy. It's like, we don't want to be around those. They start smelling, they're dirty. But when we have plenty of water and that's moving water, that's going to be healthy in life, you know, give us life. And so we need to have all of those things and things to be considering for looking at, okay, where can I make some improvements? So the overall, when it comes to our um, gut health on this kind of matrix here, the top influential genes are going to be the histamine ones. And so that HNMT and the AVP1, which is that DAO that you hear a lot about, MAA, and then IL-13 and HRH1 through 4, and that's your histamine receptors. You're going to have the oxalate genes. You're going to have some gluten ones. Um, you're going to have the B12 and bifidobacterium, like the FUT2 SNPs I see a lot. And um, those FUT2s, and we have those FUT2 SNPs, our body just doesn't really support a healthy microbiome. So oftentimes those people are going to need ongoing probiotic support. And so if you feel like, okay, I've been trying to doing the right things. So I just can never, I can get there, but I can't stay there. And it always keeps coming back to my gut. I just, my gut just always keeps having a problem. So the stress transformation, and then also looking at maybe you've got some food, two snips, you might need some support for probiotics long-term. And then looking at what's going on with bile flow. Are you able to eliminate toxins, um, making sure that whole gallbladder is really, really supportive. So different SNPs there are things to be looking at. And then again, like I can't stress the, we have that gut brain connection um, is super important. So when we're stressed, that HPA axis is going to send signals to the brain. So if it's troubled, then our gut's going to be troubled. Our body is not going to, it's going to be running from a lion. It's not going to be looking to, oh, let's, you know, rest and digest. It's like, let's just get what we can, the stress hormones get us out of here. So it's super important that we look at that gut brain connection and balance that whenever it's off, well, our brain is off, there's going to be a uh, irritability in our gastrointestinal tract. It's going to increase that visceral perception. We're going to have the secretions in our GI tract are going to be altered. We're going to have a lot of negative effect on the mucosa blood flow and the repair um, and increases in um, irritable bowel. And there's a negative effect on our neurotransmitters, our gut flora, um, much more risk for leaky gut, hormone imbalances. There's just so, it just has that trickle down effect. So that stress part kind of like shuts down that GI tract. So it's not going to be working efficiently because it's trying to run from a lion. But then the other component, there's like this matrix is the heart brain connection. And so when our heart and brain are off, well, again, it's going to trickle down. And there's actually more signaling that's happening from our heart to the brain than from the brain to the heart. We always think of like the brain is like that central, like that's the kind of the main computer, but our heart does so much. Like there's a three foot electromagnetic field from our heart that you can measure. And it's why also we measure the fetal heart rate during the labor and delivery, because we understand how important that heart rate is and the effects on a healthy baby at delivery. And so, but we just kind of forget about it once the baby's born. And it's like, oh, the heart doesn't matter. But that heart really makes a difference in helping our body to shift from that cortisol stress response into that DHEA parasympathetic state so we can repair. We need both sides. We need to be able to run from a lion when it's important, but then we also need to shift back over. So making sure that heart brain connection is reconnected is super important. And it's a bi directional, um, another bi directional relationship there. So it's both of them together. So really, it's about all three of those um, things working together. And this is another kind of one of my, you know, sciencey things here. I'll kind of skip through that one. I'm kind of getting, I think maybe running short on time here. Um, but we have this three matrix that heart, brain, and gut. So all three of those work together. So when we are creating that strategy, and we're building that foundation. We have that torn down house. The tornado came through. We've got our foundation we got to work on. Like the first things we think about is like, okay, we got to prep the foundation. We got to think about our plumbing. Where are we going to have the plumbing? Because they put that into the foundation and our framing. So it's kind of those three things work really together as to what's going to happen for that final house. And so if we don't work on those three and we kind of work on them independently, they're not really going to, the final product at the end is probably not going to be a very stable house. So next we're going to talk about hormones and methylation. So I know this is probably where I probably should stop, but I don't like, I just, I want to go on. So the other one we hear a lot about, especially like with hair loss is we always hear about the hormones 
Um, and so many that we work with, it's, you know, I think my hormones are off. My hormones are off, whether it's adrenal hormones, the sex hormones. And so your hormones are very much tied with methylation. And you hear a lot of symptoms that we have when we hear these symptoms like, oh, methylation, lots of history of miscarriages, migraines, um, high estrogen, fibroids, endometriosis, heavy periods, intolerance, taking oral contraceptives, um, breast or endometrial cancer, fatigue. When we hear those symptoms, we automatically start thinking, oh, methylation, what's going on with our methylation? Because you need, again, that SAMe and that methylation and detox to be working for these pathways to work. You're going to have those kind of symptoms. And so a simple overview here of estrogen. I know a lot of um, you have probably had a Dutch test or hormone testing. When we do those tests, we're looking at the metabolites in these pathways. So things like you see here in the light purple, those are the genes. I'm not sure if I have the arrows on here. I don't. Um, so those are actually the genes. And so like that COMT gene, that's the same one that's also in your dopamine pathway or that CYP1A1. Um, GST, that's going to be part of your glutathione. So you have to detox estrogen so that it's not a toxin in your body. So we're looking through metabolites to understand where, how are these genes working? Where do we need to support these genes? And that's why we do those tests. And so the COMT, the COMT gene is responsible for metabolism of the monomines and the catechol estrogens. Um, it's also part of that, you know, that we think of that dopamine pathway. So with, with this particular gene, when we see the genes, we have the wild type, we think usually of it a little faster. The heterozygous is sort of your normal speed, and then the homozygous is going to be slower. And so we can really see a lot of associations when we understand, okay, what's the, how is this person clearing out estrogen um, with that COMT um, SNP? So that's a really important one to look at whenever you're looking at any sort of like estrogen imbalance. Oh, there's where my arrows are at there to show you like these are the different, this is another chart. I don't know which company this one's from, but looking at, you know, what those genes are. So it's going to convert the, the CMT converts the androgens into the estrogens. Um, if it's really fast, it's going to make us things like estrogen dominance worse. And so we need to make sure that, okay, we have really fast on that, but then are we going to detox that? Is our body able to get rid of some of those estrogens because we don't want to just load it up and then now we can't detox. And so it's really important to look at um, those genes on that. And that's where when we talk about hormones, well, there's, it's actually genetics that we're looking at. And just a few of the other ones here, like the CYP19A1 uh, um, has to do with aromatase. Um, this one also can make uh, estrogen dominance worse. So, you know, 1B1 is another one that we look at. Um, all of those genes, when we're looking at genetics, that's what we're going to be looking at. But then in like, for instance, the Dutch test, it's looking at those metabolites so we can understand, oh, this is how that gene is working. So what can we do if we do have estrogen um, problems? Well, we want to first, again, like the gut health, reduce things, take away the things that are causing problems. So the top things you can do to reduce that negative and putting an extra burden on that estrogen uh, pathway is avoiding things like insecticides and pesticides, um, ruling out heavy metal exposure. So this is why we heavily, heavily stress. Um, if you have mercury fillings, for instance, we have to get rid of those first because we still have an ongoing exposure. It's like we still have that tornado going on. We're not going to be able to rebuild the house if we still have have a tornado. So we have to wait for that storm to pass so that we can clear out things and then start the rebuilding, um, you know, transforming that stress. We really need to make sure we're supporting methylation. That does not mean to run out and get methylfolate. We have to make sure we understand where those kinks are in that pathway and support that. We need to make sure we're really supporting glutathione production. Again, that doesn't always mean that we run out and get glutathione. Do we sometimes take methylfolate? Do we sometimes take glutathione? Absolutely. But it's on a case by case and, you know, situations we know that, oh, your glutathione is tanked. We need to get you boosted here, get you out of the ditch, get you back on the road. And then we can make a different plan once we are on the road. How can we keep you on the road? So, um, you know, those are things to look at. Resveratrol is another one that we often look at that's going to really, really help with um, that decreasing the estrogen burden on the estrogen pathway. Um, NAC, and acetylcysteine that's going to be kind of a step between the homocysteine and the glutathione is that NAC is the in between that. Um, iodine bifidobacterium longum. And so that's where your microbiome can play a huge role on your estrogen and the estrogen dominance. And so that's where the gut health, again, comes back into play. Uh, calcium deglucurate. And so this one, I really should probably put stars or red on because I just see this quite often is um, calcium deglucurate can work really, really well. Too little estrogen is also a problem. So estrogen needs to be unbalanced. 
So if we overtake any of these, even though they're not pharmaceuticals, we can still influence, like Julie was talking about earlier, we can still negatively impact this. So just like the CME can turn off that MTHFR, too much calcium deglucrate can deplete our estrogen. And now we're low on estrogen. And that's a whole nother bucket of symptoms, or some of the symptoms are actually the same. And it's really then hard to differentiate, like, is it estrogen dominance? Is it not? And so don't just run out and get all these, but these would be the ones to be like, oh, do I need these? What else can you do to investigate that? Oh yes, this is what I need to be taking. And that's why, again, the Dutch test is a great test for that is it helps you understand like, oh, where's my problem at? So the solution to that. So the solution is looking at that bigger picture, the basics. We cannot forget the basics. Like it's super, super important that you just remember that illustration of that storm comes through. We don't go out and go buy furniture as soon as that storm came through and tore down our house. We got to build the foundation. We had to put the walls up. We got to get our wiring, our plumbing in first. You know, self-care is the top priority. And for women, I know this in moms, especially, I know this can be crazy difficult, um, but it's really, really super important. Uh, transforming that stress you know, doing things in, to transform stress, get on that other side, not completely just avoiding things or managing stress. We need to make sure that our body can go in that sympathetic state, but also in the parasympathetic state. We need to be able to go back and forth between the two. Um, eating clean foods. So I'm not really into, you know, everyone should be doing keto or they should be doing this or that. It needs to be clean foods and then tweak and identify what are the foods that you need to eat. Um, if we get on a very restrictive diet, it's going to negatively affect our microbiome. That's going to lead to a whole nother, you know, that cascade of symptoms. So it just needs to be start with clean foods and then identify where do I need to make tweaks on that? There's a couple exceptions to that. And that one is usually gluten and dairy. And so gluten, I pretty much across the board, I'm going to say avoid gluten um, for a minimum of six months um, because gluten will trigger zonulin. Zonulin will open the doors to your um, gut, the, the tight junctions between the cells. So that's similar to all the doors and windows of your house opening. And so when you open the doors, like right now in East Texas, it's going to let in that crazy heat and bugs in our house. Um, it's going to let our air conditioner out. And so closing that just is an easier way to keep some of these toxins and other problems getting on the other side of your GI tract that doesn't belong there. And then the dairy is sort of the flip of that. It's like you have a blockade. So it's very mucus forming. And so now you can't open your doors and windows to get in or out of your house. And so those would be the top two that I'd say pretty well across the board. It's like, we've got to stop those two, at least while we're figuring things out. Um, but other than what that, just eating clean, real foods that are not processed um, is, is a big component to that. Um, identifying the triggers, the pathogens, nutrient deficiencies, you know, is there heavy metals, mold, um, lime? Um, is there stress? Is there toxic relationships? Like that one is huge. If there's trauma, um, and again, where that transforming stress, sometimes that stress is buried trauma that your body, your limbic system is still stuck there. We have to get that limbic system move to that other side. Um, and then following those principles, those four GI principles of, you know, removing, replacing, um, repair, those things, re-inoculating, because we have to do things in that order. Again, the house, we don't go get furniture first and then supplement only when needed. So I don't do a lot of supplements. I'm very specific whenever I do them. Um, I don't just say, okay, here's this problem and here's this test result. Let's get our supplements for that one. We have to look at that bigger picture. Really, really super important to look at that bigger picture. So then how do we decide what supplements to do? Well, we go again, the basics, look at the foundation. What do we need to work with for your foundation? Where are their problems at? Do you need something to do with your plumbing? Is there more with your, the framing of the house? Where is it that you need your, those foundational pathways first? And then make sure your detox pathways are working before you really try to push a heavy detox. So if our detox pathways aren't working, it's like we're, we've got a drain that's clogged, pouring more water in it is not going to clear it out. It's going to overflow. And now what? There's going to be problems all over the rest of our house. So we first have to get the things working, then we can really start using them, if that makes sense. Um, look for zero to very, very few extra ingredients and things. When you are getting things that are already made, um, make sure you have the fewest, if not any extra ingredients. Avoid synthetic folic acid. So the synthetic folic acid can slow down, just like excess CME can slow down that uh, MTHFR and that folate pathway. 
Um, be very cautious of getting online uh, supplements from online, especially as Amazon. There's like zero practically contr uh, quality control at Amazon. Um, like their storage, those things. There's just been a lot of things with Amazon. Um, I would, if you're going to get them, get them from a very reputable place. Um, I know there's, I've got full script in most places, you know, practitioners have full script now, but just Amazon, their quality control is really not good. <laughs> um, always know why you're taking a supplement. So, uh, and what that bigger picture is and be very cautious when there's just, oh, this is your SNP or this is your diagnosis, or this is your, whatever it happens to be. And here's your supplement protocol that is used on everybody else. Um, make sure you have a diary of symptoms so you can understand any reactions you're having and share those with your provider. Sometimes, you know, there may be a reaction that's actually completely a common reaction and one that's expected, but sometimes, and I do this myself, we don't necessarily always express it. Oh yeah, forgot to tell you, this is probably what's going to happen. So if you don't share that with them, they're not going to be able to tell you that, oh yes, that's right. That's actually normal for that to happen in a healthy way. Um, or it's like, oh, I did, when well, they realize that, oh, well, this tells us something else that's happening in those pathways. So make sure you share the reactions that you are having so that they can help you make adjustments and either say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, you know, that actually is very common <laughs> or, oh, hmm, I wonder why that happened. So just really important to keep those diary to know that, okay, how do you feel whenever you, before you take it, how do you feel 15 minutes later? Or sometimes those reactions could take, you know, longer than 15, 30 minutes, but those are the, some of your do's and the don'ts, which I probably don't have to repeat. You probably already got this by now is do not run out and get a methyl vitamin just because you have an MTHFR SNP or any of the other SNPs in the methylation cycle. And I know that probably many of you who are here because you've already learned that, that, oh, I went and got methylfolate and now I feel worse. Um, so don't do that. If you haven't done that, don't do it. And then don't do any supplement just because of a SNP. Oh, you know, don't use a SNP as your only reason. So understand that SNP. Okay, how does it work? What's that pathway do? How do I know, is that SNP actually expressing itself? Is it causing problems? That goes back to that agouti mice experiment that I talked in the beginning. The mom was genetically predisposed for very unhealthy mice. When they fed her really good food, her babies were really, really healthy, completely different color, completely different body types because those genes were expressing differently. And so we can really influence these metabolic genes. So just make sure you're looking at that bigger picture. So then always choose them based on the bigger picture with really an emphasis on supporting how can you help the body return to that homeostasis? Because your body wants to get you back to normal. That's why you have the symptoms and why we get inflammation because your body is trying to protect us from whatever it happens to be. It has to rob Peter to pay Paul. Eventually it can't do that. And then it starts scrambling and we have a host of symptoms, but the body's signaling, there's signal pathways for us to get to healing. So how do we create that personalized strategy? Looking at our genetics is, I think, a really, really, um, I don't know, I guess like Julie uses the word like a gift a lot about her hair loss. And that was a gift to her. I think the genetics, the where we're at today in our technology, it's just like the insights we can get on that is just absolutely amazing. So, it, but then on top of that, having those genes, we really need to look at what's going on with your symptoms, what's going on with your labs, your history. We need to know those other components to really put those genetics to work. So what I do for my practice, when I work with other practices like Julie's practice or any other practices that I do this with is looking at genes symptoms and labs. So all three of them together. I like the functional genomic analysis test. Um, it's way more comprehensive than 23andMe or Ancestry. Um, it's going to look at, you know, basically the whole entire genome on these metabolic genes. And then we're also going to look at the symptoms and the labs. So when we use that, um, the software, this is on, unfortunately on my side, I, I usually give a screenshot to those that I work with. So you can see this too, of what your gene profile looks like, but it helps to understand like, this is the pathways, where are there potential genetic problems at, where there's symptom problems at, and where the lab showing these things are expressing. So we can put these all into context and understand, okay, where do you need to start at? And as you see here, MTHFR virus here at the top, we got to start on the foundation. So if we start, again, supplementing this methylfolate in the beginning, we've got a clogged drain. We're just adding more water to that drain that's just not going to overflow and make it this big, ginormous mess. So generally speaking, anything in the green, those pathways in the green here, we work on first, um, especially these bottom two uh, rows, really need to understand some of these inflammatory responses and those inflammatory signaling that's happening. The gut health, what's going on with your gut, like histamines, um, oxalates, um, some of the mast cell, EMFs, um, your interleukin-6, your IL-6, I don't think I had in this presentation, but um, that inflammatory response is really important. Like what's the signaling going on there? Your nerve two, keep one. That's kind of like your um, 
fire alarm and sprinkler system. If those two things aren't signaling properly, you're not gonna have the right amount of antioxidants expressed when the fire goes off. And so understanding those pathways and how, what can we do to help modulate those? Or, and I think this fats, carbs, and uh, the fats and carbs and proteins, especially the fats should be in the bottom personally. And, and then when you guys do consults with me, uh, I always talk about that because the fats play a big role in the integrity of our cells and things transmitting. And so if we have poor integrity, it's like our house has paper thin walls. The doors and windows cannot hang on that very well. Things are not gonna transport through it very well. Uh, we got, you know, just paper strings for wiring. We have to have healthy integrity of the cells is crazy, crazy important. So I get it. They couldn't put everything on the two bottom ones, but that's why it's also here, like in this lighter green, like all these greens are really, really important. So looking at those things and understanding the matrix between them and where are we seeing that common denominator? Like there's a lot of overlap in these pathways. And so it helps us to kind of differentiate between that. And so with the functional genomic analysis, you're going to get several reports. There's a methylation report, free radicals, antioxidants, your fats, your neurotransmitters, your Lyme. So it's tons and tons of reports. Some of it is very, very overwhelming. And so um, it, it can be Overwhelming. So I also do when I do mine, I also will give you access to the pure genomics, which is a little simpler, more simplified, and it's much more up to date user friendly. I mean, they're both up to date research wise, but the user friendliness of them and looking like, okay, you know, I can pretty much understand this. Um, so you get both those and it's going to get a little bit different reports. It's going to do um, your vitamins, minerals, and omega. It only does the omega threes where omega sixes are crazy important as well. And um, you've, you've heard me much. I usually talk a lot about omega sixes and there's a DGLA, GLA converts to DGLA. And a lot of times that's the problem. There's none of healthy omega six. We had, there are healthy omega sixes, uh, glucose metabolism, weight management, cardiovascular health, cognitive health, memory, detoxification. So so those are the reports that you get with the pure genomics. So whenever I do the genetics, you're going to get both of those. So both of those are included in whenever I do the genetics. And it doesn't matter if it's 23andMe, Ancestry, or the genetics that I use. Um, they will work with all those. You just get the raw data for them. And so right now I am running a special, which I don't think I've ever done a special like this before, but um, the test kit itself is 249, um, which that's not really on special. That's just the price on that one. And, but the consultant test, um, if you have like your 23 Me. Um, is 197, or if you want the entire the test kit, like the FGA test kit, as well as a case review, is 397. And when I do my case reviews, how it works is when we meet, when we actually go over your genetics, we go over everything from that day for 30 days after that day. Um, you have access to have another point with me, like any kind of follow-ups, because there's usually going to be more questions because I usually give a lot of information. So follow-ups are included for 30 days. And if you want to have more than one, I usually will do more than one if I have it availability on my calendar. Um, so that you can go to the functionalperspective.com FGA. And I think that's all I have. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm only doing that pricing through August 1st because I... Um, don't want to get overly loaded on my schedule. So get in as quickly as you can. So uh, before my schedule gets too filled. Um, and then I guess that's basically it. So what questions do you all have? I hope this was helpful. And again, there will be a replay. I will send a link out for that. It's going to probably be a day or two that I, before I can get to that, but I will get that replay email to you guys, the link for that. And then what all do you guys have for questions? And Julie, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Julie? No, I just think your analogy of you know, not uh, moving in the furniture before you even have the house foundation built and clearing out the storm. It's just so important. I mean, it, it, because we run into it all the time, people skip steps and you, you're going to waste a lot of time and money and whatever conditions you're trying to fix, they're really going to get worse. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to to work with that practitioner and go through those steps because the steps are different for everyone and you, you just can't go out and buy supplements and and yeah. expect things to get better because again you can take too much even too much iodine can really jack you up too much even um biotin which is in every hair loss supplement i anyway yeah. so that's why i mean it i know it's one of Selena's pet peeves because a lot of these genetic tests, they just give you supplements to take. Mm -hmm. They don't walk you through it like Selena will. She'll walk you through everything. And it is a lot. <laughs> just they so just, you know, put on your your thinking cap and and it's it's really interesting. But she's very thorough. Believe me, I've done other genetic testing and 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 
Selena is very thorough and really personalizes it for you and just doesn't give you the easy thing is to just give you a list of supplements. And believe me, that's what these other genetic mm. tests and companies, that's what they do. <laughs> All right. So. Yeah.